talked about this idea of degrees of freedom, which we'll see recur throughout some of these different tests. Degrees of freedom is this idea that when we make estimates and statistics, we sacrifice degrees of freedom. I often equate degrees of freedom to our currency. They're what we have to spend in statistics. And the more things you want to include as estimates, the more you spend your degrees of freedom. So you always start with n degrees of freedom. Why? because you have as many free scores to vary as people. So for example, if I have, you know, five scores, let's do four scores. If I have four scores, so three, seven, nine, and nine. Say I've got these four scores. Now, if I haven't done any estimation with these scores, each of them can be whatever value they want. How do I know? Well, if I were to erase those values, there is nothing you know about those data to say that they must be certain scores, right? They could be whatever they want. They're free to vary. Every person can take on whatever value they want. But once we start doing estimation or computation, we spend degrees of freedom and essentially lock scores in place. What do I mean by this? Well, let's get those same numbers, three, seven, nine, and nine. So we've got these values. Now let's say we do a computation and we get an average for these scores. So if we get the average for these scores, we've got 10 plus 18 is 28 divided by four, right? So if our average is 28 divided by four, then our average would be seven. So with an average of seven, knowing that my sample average is seven, right? That's a really bad seven, sorry. Doing the best I can. So if the average is seven, what happens if I say lose a value? So if I know that the average for a set of four scores is seven, I know n is four, if I know these things to be true, and I know that there's a 3, a 7, and a 9, and then x4, the fourth score of x, but I don't know that number, it's unknown, can I find this number? And algebraically, you should realize the answer is yes, because I could do, okay, I know that the average is going to be all of these numbers added together, divided by 4, is going to equal 7. So you'll notice that I only have one unknown in this equation, and I can solve for that. So there's only one number this could be to make this mathematical statement true. So once I've estimated the mean, I have constrained a score. It must be 9. It cannot be anything else. It's no longer free to vary. So this is the essential process and principle behind degrees of freedom. And it turns out that not only is it kind of mathematically essential, um, but it also ensures that the variance for a sample is unbiased because what it does is when you divide by n minus one, you divide by a smaller number, the product or the quotient will be larger. And if you just have a sample, samples tend to underestimate the population variance. Because if you think about it, if I only get you know 15 people, it's unlikely that those 15 people are gonna have variance that's as much as you know 15, thousand people, right? There's going to be probably more variance in that larger group just because you've measured more people. So sample variance tends to underestimate population variance. But when we divide by degrees of freedom, which here is n minus one, so that's our first degree of freedom term we learned here. Degree of freedom for sample variance equals n minus one, right? And when we divide by this degree of freedom term, it ensures that our sample variance is an unbiased estimate of population variance, which is another nice thing. So it is both mathematically necessary in statistics and ensures unbiasedness in the estimation. Now, this will come back and we will learn that degrees of freedom takes different forms in different tests, but the idea is always the same, that you start with n degrees of freedom and you're gonna lose degrees of freedom with estimates. So when you get like, oh, I'm going to estimate an average, that's going to constrain a degree of freedom. 
So we'll see this come back. I like teaching these two rules because they help make sense of degrees of freedom in other contexts. Whereas otherwise, you're probably just going to have to feel like you're going to memorize what it is for a T test and for an F test and for all those different tests. So if you find it useful, great. If you don't, then you can just kind of plug in a memory that you divide by N minus 1 for sample variance and you divide by N for population. Whatever you prefer. I like to give explanations of why, but I'm okay if it works better for you to just memorize what is. So we can then say computationally that all variance is simply the sum of squares divided by the degrees of freedom. Just bearing in mind that for degrees of freedom for a population would equal N, but degrees of freedom for a sample would equal N minus 1. But both of those would be what we would call the degree of freedom. So conceptually, sum of squares over degrees of freedom is variance, right? That is what it is. All right. So hopefully that makes some sense.